the old timers, you know, the bluegrass was out doing the shows and making the money, and the old timers had retreated to the back porch. You know, Tommy Jarrell had stopped playing for 30 years. And, uh, and then when the, our generation came along, somehow we valued it highly. I don't know why. Some, you know, something in you that grabs this music. And they started coming out to festivals, and they realized the young people really were. Same with Melvin Wine. It's sort of like, wow, you know, we have something to offer, and they love us, so let's do it. <laughs> so I guess yeah. they, I guess they were kind of surprised that that someone didn't follow the bluegrass path. You know, that's interesting. I came in late enough that they were already enjoying, you know, people a little bit older than me. But like Mel, I the story I heard is Melvin Wine when they started showing up in the late 60s, you know, and going around barefooted and hadn't showered in a couple of days, Melvin was appalled. And he went to his preacher and said, you know, what, what, what do you think about all this going on? The preacher said, preach to them. So Melvin went out with his fiddle and just started this whole, he went to Central West Virginia doing this. And, and uh, Tommy Gerald, I think, just loved to party. You know, so. <laughs> but somewhere during the partying, he said, okay, enough of this, let's play music. <laughs> I was always too shy to go to his house, and I never ever played in front of Tommy. I would just sit there and, and try to absorb that bowing. Because I started out with drums in the fourth grade, and I always liked the rhythm, because my dad had taken me to Highland Games. So that was the extent of my family musical interaction. Was to, and I, I loved the fife and drum corps. He was an you know, army guy, so he loved the marching part. But I got into the drums, and uh, I didn't stay in the orchestra long because I didn't want to read the music. I just wanted to keep the rhythm. So. That was a natural for folk music. <laughs> and uh, so Tommy's, uh, all these guys bowing was what's most fascinating to me. Uh, some more of a mechanic than a natural. It's some people just pick up on the music, you know, like my friend Pete, other people you hear just. But I was into more into how, how do they do that mechanically? And so uh, Tommy, I would just sit and watch, but Melvin, you know, he was such a kind guy, and he would sit down with you. And he wouldn't teach you, and he did review me on a couple of tunes now and then, but but uh, I picked up that his his early recordings had a four-string banjo in it, so I'd take my four-string up and play with him and, and do what his sons were doing. So uh, it was very much more personal with Melvin. And of course, other people I'd record. Of course, the guys that were gone, I'd just listen to the recordings. You know, French Carpenter, that's probably my first really heavy music was in the French Carpenter. Of course, we listened to Ernie Carpenter. He really had a different style, but the same repertoire, so you could hear the different approaches. And, uh, and other people, you know, like I say, they're all glad to sit down and, and play for you. But, and the, but, you know, you had to, you know, I don't even know if they were aware of their style because it was so natural to them and it was absorbed so locally that they wouldn't, uh, I don't know if they'd, do more than just show you what they were doing, or you're supposed to just pick it up. And of course, that was all before video. Although in the last years, I did video some of the Western Virginia stuff. Um, but mainly, they were just accessible. <laughs>